good afternoon to those of you who are uh, joining us for the Field to Fork program this afternoon. Our usual host, Judy, Julie Garden Robinson, is having some uh, Zoom difficulties, so I'm Barb Bingham, and I'll get us started today. Um, the webinar today is brought to us by North Dakota State University Extension. If you missed the last one, it's archived and on the Field to Fork site. And I see some of you, as I've noticed in previous weeks, are already letting us know uh, where, you from, where you're from. Uh, this is the eighth year we've done the series, and we are so glad you joined us today. We've archived all of the webinars from the previous years, and the link is on the Field to Fork webinar um, page. So we've got two upcoming webinars on March 22nd, which is next Wednesday. What does time temperature control mean for food processors and entrepreneurs by uh, Byron Chavez Elzondo um, from University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And then in March 29th, food safety considerations and organic produce um, production, and that's uh, London Wadiki. Um, from Kansas State uh, University and the University of Missouri. Most of you, it sounds like from the, your participation already are familiar with uh, the controls, but if you're new, uh, just so that you know, we're actually going to be ignoring the, um, the Q&A function, but you'll find the chat function um, at the bottom of your screen, and that's where you'll be able to ask questions of today's um, presentation. Um, we're also asking you to try out the chat function and um, let us know where you're from. And many of you have done that um, already today. So thank you very much um, for that. Okay, the next slide is our acknowledgement slide. Um, this program is sponsored in part with grant funding from the USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service. I'll ask that all of you um, are going to please complete a short online survey that will be emailed right after today's webinar. Um, as a thank you, um, Julie will actually be providing prizes to the winners of the random drawings. So to be sure to complete, uh, provide your complete address on the follow-up form, including state, city, state, and zip code. Um, some of us may have already gotten that, um, that survey. Um, it will be for today's webinar and just hold it to the end of the presentation to get today. All right, I'm Barb Bingham. I'm a food safety specialist and professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, and I'm delighted to talk with you today about safely using a steam canner to preserve the bounty of the harvest. This is work that uh, we have done uh, a number of years ago, and we're just delighted to be able to share this research with you and to um, kind of get the word out um, with what we found in this research. So as you're, um, as you're working on uh, typing in uh, where you're from to let us know today, if you don't mind also uh, returning to the chat um, and letting us know what acidic food, um, this might be pickles or sauces or something like that, do you most enjoy canning at home? Kind of a good way for us to get um, the thoughts uh, um, process going. I provided some pictures that I could find on the internet and we've heard some wonderful presentations over the last a uh, couple of weeks about um, vegetable varieties and, and growing vegetables. And so many of us are getting excited about getting into our gardens um, maybe within the next month. So we've got some um, pickles, tomatoes, um, all of it <laughs> was a comment that we just saw. That's probably my favorite comment. And I totally um, agree with that. All right. So, um, we want to start off with uh, today's presentation with a little bit of foundational information, especially if you're new to canning. Um, but when you're canning certain types of food, um, we, we, we look at two really basic concepts. One is pH, or is an acid value of the food products, and the other is heat. Both of these work together, and we must have both of these in order to have um, safe home-preserved products. 
So foods that are acid or acidified um, are those that are high in acid. And we sometimes also say low in pH. Uh, so that pH is 4.6 or below. And we know when we're at a pH of 4.6 or below, this is going to prevent the germination of spores of Clostridium botulinum. And many of us have heard of Clostridium botulinum or the disease that it causes botulism. Um, so we're using acid as a really critical component of these food products, um, and that helps us control botulinum. And then we also need heat because there are other pathogens outside of Clostridium botulinum, specifically pathogenic E. coli um, that may be in our food products, and we want to um, we want to uh, prevent uh, these from being able to grow and exist in the food products. So heat is required to destroy what we refer to as vegetative cells um, of pathogens and spoilage organisms. Another advantage of heat, it's going to destroy yeast and mold, which would um, cause spoilage. Um, heat processing also removes air um, entrapped in the food matrix and in the headspace of the jar and helps us to get a really good seal on those home preserved products. So we normally and historically uh, for acid foods have used a boiling water canner. In a boiling water canner, probably many of you are familiar with these. We place the food in the jar, we put on our two-piece lid, and then we submerge those foods in water. Uh, generally starts off warm, and eventually we're going to be uh, bringing that water to a boil and then timing the process. So we use boiling water canners for naturally acid foods, which are most fruits, um, and then acidified foods. These are things like pickles, um, salsa products that may not be acid enough without the addition of something like vinegar. In a boiling water canner, the jars sit on a rack uh, surrounded by boiling water, and they're actually covered entirely uh, submerged in water, so covered by an inch or two of water. We use what we say is a tight fitting lid. It doesn't have to be um, secured um, too tightly, but it does need to have a lid on the pot that prevents too much evaporation and keeps the processing um, temperature at boiling. And we're generally processing food at about 212 degrees, which is the boiling temperature of water at um, sea level. Um, Generally, even in Wisconsin, water, we, we're not that much above sea level. Um, even at our highest point in Wisconsin, water boils here between about 200 and um, around 210 degrees Fahrenheit. Different parts of the country, as your elevation rises above sea level, uh, your boiling point drops. Um, and we then need to adjust our um, processing time for elevation. We'll talk about that with some recipe examples. So we adjust processing time for elevation. And in everything we're talking about today, we're going to base what we do um, in a boiling water canner traditionally or in a pressure in a I'm sorry, an atmospheric steam canner. We're going to use research tested recipes. These might be things that's found from the National Center for Home Food Preservation website. If you haven't found that yet, it's a great place for you to look. NCHFP is the National Center for Home Food Preservation. It's at the University of Georgia. So nchfp.uga.edu. They have a wealth of information there, including the USDA Complete Guide to Home Canning. And many of the recipes on their website are extracted from that USDA research. So this is a boiling water canning process. All right, I'm going to um, advance to this next slide here. So um, what? So a boiling water canner might use about 16 or more quarts of water. That's a lot. It's especially with the cost of water and in an increasing situations of drought that we might find ourselves in. Um, it also can take a long time for that amount of water to come to a boil. So what if we didn't have to wait for all that water to boil and we didn't have to use so much water? So in the top picture here on the left, you see a picture of a traditional boiling water canner. So what about an atmospheric steam canner? We often shorten this to just call them steam canners. Um, so in a steam canning process, it's, uh, it, 
it's a much uh, shallower base. It has a tall domed lid. And I like this picture here because you can see there's a rack in the bottom of the canner where the jars sit during processing. We actually fill water up to the bottom of this rack here, um, and then jars sit um, on the rack above boiling water. So you can see in the picture on the right here of a steam canner, how this looks like something maybe like peaches um, that are jars have been placed um, in the canner. So uh, um, as a sub award from the National Center for Home Food Preservation, we, um, we were given the opportunity to actually research these steam canners to see if we could use those in place of a boiling water water canner for um, acid foods. So that's exactly what we did when we had the research um, uh, grant was awarded to us here in Wisconsin. Um, Let's see. Oh, we see, I'm sorry. I just see Ju Julie has rejoined us. We're glad and ask her to take a deep breath uh, because of computer problems. We're glad she's back with us and she's reminding us to please post questions that we have in the chat. Um, Anyway, so when we're looking at comparing a boiling water canner and a steam canner, um, the first thing we're uh, looking at is, um, we're gonna look at is how do they heat the food that's in there? One is using boiling water, the other's using steam, and how does um, the temperature distribute within the canner? So we used both a boiling water canner um, a traditional one and a steam canner um, like this. Um, and then in order to answer at least our initial questions, you'll see some kind of just uh, hand drawings um, that are supposed to illustrate first a boiling water canner and then a steam canner. So the first part of our research, what we did was we took what are called thermocouples. These are like very, very thin um, thermometers. And we place those at different depths within the heating medium, uh, the water that's boiling or within the steam. We drill, drilled holes within the top of our canners so that we could do this. And then we're looking initially, and I'll show you on our next slide, we, we're looking initially at how does heat distribute within the canner because we need heat coming outside the jars to move into the jars to heat the food um, that we're using. All right, so how do boiling water or steam heat the jars that are in the canner? In order for us to um, first off answer this question, um, we, we um, used tomato juice. We use tomato juice as a something more than water. It's a, it's a nice, uh, it's thicker. Um, and we were trying to figure out how jars of tomato juice were heating just based on what the temperature was within the canner, either the boiling water canner or the steam canner. So we had jars of tomato juice that we placed here uh, in the canner. There's normally water here. These are of course just pictures that I'm showing you from the research Research. And you can see here in one of these images, you can see these are thermocouples. These are very thin um, thermometers that are that are um, at different depths within the um, within the heating column. And we're just trying to figure out initially how do these particular canners heat. So that was the first question that we tried to answer. Before I move on, because I think it's a nice illustration of a steam canner, um, these domed canner lids here, um, they have at least one vent hole in the side. So um, here on the graphic, the illustration that we created, there's one. Sometimes these canners come with only one if you are actually going to use these for acid foods, we recommend that you just take a drill or a knife, um, not a knife, um, a nail and poke a hole so that you have um, two holes that are opposite. That actually is better for steam distribution within the canner. So we had a vent hole on either side. They're just above um, the where the lid um, the dome lid um, um, just fits into the base of the canner. All right, so we looked at heat distribution in a boiling water or a steam canner. We used tomato juice and we hot filled it, which is what you're supposed to do, or we filled the jars at room temperature, about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not what you're supposed to do, but we were just trying to figure out how these different canners 
were comparing in terms of the heating medium. We use quart jars, pint jars, and half pint jars. And then we again had these probes, these thermocouple probes at varying depths to see how these canners themselves are heating. So something that we anticipated and that we were able to clearly demonstrate with this research is it takes a lot, a long time to heat a lot of water to boiling, regardless of whether we put in um, the tomato juice at room temperature, so it wasn't preheated, or if we put hot tomato juice into the canner itself. Um, so it took 22 minutes um, for the, the boiling water um, to heat um, just to the initial temperature of 180, um, which would have been um, a standard temperature where we might load jars into a canner. And then it took an additional roughly 10 minutes to heat from 180 degrees, which is a good simmer, um, where you have a boiling water canner ready on the stove and you're adding your jars to hot water um, and then eventually um, bringing that water up to a boiling temperature. For us again here in Wisconsin, that's 210 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then um, it took another, another 10 degrees again to go from a good summer to 210 or boiling, another 10 minutes. For this entire process for the steam canner, where I'm heating just two quarts of water and starting with that water being at roughly room temperature, 75 degrees, it took 12 minutes for that canner um, and for these temperature probes, either in the boiling water canner or the temperature probes in my um, steam canner to say, I am at boiling. I am at steaming, steam being created in the canner. So um, the boiling water canner, the, the range um, of temperature for this simmer, um, simmering temperature to 210, um, we said it was 10 minutes on average, it ranged from six minutes to 11 minutes over 54 different trials. For the atmospheric steam canner, it ranged from nine to 12. So I put 12 minutes there. They're about the same, um, 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 the way I had done these averages. So the results from the first part of our study over lots of tomato juice um, that we put through the canning process was the time to preheat the water in a boiling water canner adds significantly to the overall process time. It takes about perhaps 30 minutes before um, you can actually start, you know that the water is actively boiling and you can start the process time itself. The longest total process time was observed when each canner was operated at full capacity. So sometimes we tried like seven quart jars, sometimes we tried one quart jar and those types of things. So we tried the canners full, we tried the canners half full, and then we tried them with just one jar of each size. So it makes sense that it the longest times and the longer, longest time it took for heat to fully distribute in each of the canners was when the canners were at full capacity. So from then on out, we, oper we did all of our research at what we called full capacity. We filled the canners, um, regardless of the type of canner we were looking at. All right, so this is, an example of some of the information that we might have gotten out of this, the first part of the study. So we had four different thermocouples at four different depths within the steam dome for the steam canner. And these were tracking temperature over time. So we put uh, canner quart jars in the canner. And then, so I'm just tracking that here. I just put an indication we had the canner on the stove for a little bit. We're adding our jars. And then an indication that we're seeing the initial puffs of steam come out of those vent holes. This happens to be in a, in a steam canner about 
200, just over 200 degrees around that point, and we're seeing full steam at 210 to 212 degrees. And we're recording all of this on the computer um, as we go. So that's how this was. Um, our results were that heat, di heat distribution within each canner, whether we were using a boiling water canner or a steam canner, when our thermocouples, our thermometers read 210 to 212 boiling temperature, we found that there was a good consistency. There was boiling water um, temperatures recorded throughout the the boiling water column in a boiling water canner or throughout the steam dome in a steam canner. So. Um, we got good consistency there. So we knew that once we reached the processing temperature um, that we could, um, that we would be able to, um, to then start our processing time. And I've got some hints for you about that later. So, so we knew our canners were, could, we knew how to operate each of the canners, certainly a boiling water canner from historically, we've been using those and we knew then how to operate a steam canner um, so that we were operating at boiling, at, at steaming temperatures. So the next part of our research was we took four different food products and we said, all right, um, if we're operating these two canners um, each individually, how, do the, how does food that's in the canner heat? in jars within the canner. Um, how is that food heating? Um, so what we, we used four food products at this um, uh, point. We used tomato juice, uh, cranberries and heavy syrup um, because that was a nice, lots of little um, pieces of particulate in the product. Um, and then the heavy syrup helped us understand some heat transfer and applesauce. Those were all in pint jars. And then in half pint jars, we tried chocolate raspberry dessert sauce. And I will tell you that we did this in a lab where we use pathogens. So, of course, we aren't able to ever eat anything in the lab or um, although we do have food products in the laboratory, but it really smelled good um, when we were actually making up the dessert sauce and then doing the canning. So we use pint jars and half pint jars. Um, we used only pint, we used pint jars as the largest size jars for the research. And that's because when we did this, when we're looking at circulation of heat within the jars, we have to add a little um, uh, fitment here that attaches the thermocouple. The thermocouple, you can kind of see it in this picture, attaches the thermocouple and allows us to place that thermocouple at different places within that jar. It kind of slides up and down depending on how the food heats. So because of this, when we use quart jars and we added this extra part to the top, our canner lid wouldn't fit. So we only did research with pints and half pints. You'll see later that you certainly can use either of these canners with quart sized jars, but our research was limited because of this extra, because of the, the way we had to do the research. Anyway, so we used tested recipes approved for a boiling water canner, and all of these were um, that case. Um, and then um, while heating, while we heated the food, we measured the temperature of the heating medium in the canners, canner. So we continued to say, is the water boiling when it looks like it's boiling? Is the steam canner when it's venting um, and we're seeing venting happen, is there actually um, steaming temperatures or boiling temperatures within the canner? And then we also measured the temperature inside the jar at the cold spot. So we had to do some initial work to understand what the cold spot was for each type of food product. And it varies on the way the food product heats. And then, um, so we measured that. And then we measured the temperature of the heating medium itself. And then once we were done, we tested to see, did these um, processes, either in a boiling water canner or a steam canner, do a good job of getting the air out of the jars and giving us that really good vacuum seal? Because a good intact vacuum seal is a, 
an important part of your product lasting on the shelf. So if you process food and then want it hopefully to last you until your next harvest season, we want that seal not to become uh, loosened over time. And if we have a, a very, um, uh, if we have a seal but not a really strong vacuum, it may indeed over time, the seal may somewhat relax and the jars may open and then they'll, they'll spoil over time. So um, this all allowed us to also calculate um, with the help of a food engineer, what we refer to as the process lethality. And I'll show you a little bit about how we went about that as well. Um, and that's on this slide. So what we do to calculate lethality is, are we able to kill off those bad bugs that we need to um, as a result of the process? What we did is we looked at our, our temperature within the jar. Um, that's on this uh, Y axis here, the one that's uh, the vertical axis. And then on the horizontal axis, um, we looked at time. And in order to calculate lethality, we can actually um, consider the amount of heat the computer is recording um, over time. And we kind of create a sum of of there's heat, there's heat, there's heat, there's heat, there's heat, and we add all this heat together to create what we refer to as a calculated thermal process um, lethality. So process lethality was a pair compared across runs, across different trials that we ran to determine how to adjust tested recipes for use in an atmospheric steam canner. So we did again this in both types of canners and then we're doing some calculations to help us uh, compare those numerically um, as a result. Okay, so our research results um, and the student, uh, Paula Wilmore, who did this work, she just did a, a really great job. I should have acknowledged her at the very beginning. I would like to say this was her master's project um, and she was very dedicated to this work and just did a really nice job. So some overall summary about our research and then I'm going to give you some particulars about a steam canner per se. So canner temperature is important to process lethality. We need to have the water uh, actively boiling, or we need to have uh, an atmosphere of pure steam in our steam dome. And this is important to make sure that we have both spoilage organisms and pathogens destroyed inside the food product. The rate of food product heating um, was not different in a boiling water canner or a steam canner. So both, both boiling water and steam that are circulating in the respective type of canner are easily able to transfer heat um, into the jar. And then that, that heat is able to transfer within the jar so that we can get the food to heat in all parts of the food within the jar. Interestingly enough, um, this is something that was new to me um, as a person who's um, been a home canner for basically all my life, if I consider helping my mom. Um, but what I learned um, was a significant portion of process lethality, and this is how good this is at making sure we don't have spoilage organisms and pathogens in our final product, is on cooling for these short processes. Now, this would be different for uh, if you're using a pressure canner um, and you're heating at um, under pressure, so that's different, but these shorter processes processes that we have for acid foods or acidified foods, um, because they're, they're often much shorter when we take that product out and, and out of the canner and then allow it to sit to cool on the counter, there's still um, things happening within the jar itself. And those are contributing to the lethality that we need. And so this is really good for us. Um, either process yielded strong vacuum seals. So 20, 20 to 25 PSI across 87 jars that we tested. So this is a good indication that either type of canner either a boiling water canner or a steam canner for acid or acidified foods um, is going to give you a product that should 
be able to stay um, for as long as you expect it to stay on the shelf. Generally, we say a year or two um, is a good shelf life for a canned food product. I provide here a reference um, just so you can see we published this work. We published the initial part with heat transfer in a food engineering journal. The, the kind of research into action, how would we use this to can food? to actually can food products itself was in a journal known as Food Protection Trends. Okay, so how do we take that research and then apply it to, to information that those of us who are home canners might like? So we have some general guidelines um, for this, and then I'm going to show you, uh, point you to in just a little bit, and a few slides here, um, uh, a reference that we've created that summarizes this and helps you with this process. So some general guidelines for safely using a steam canner for home food preser preservation. Uh, so a steam canner or sometimes an atmospheric steam canner, those are consistent terms. A steam canner may be used to safely can high acid foods. So these that are naturally high in acid like most fruits or acidified things like pickles and salsa as long as all of the following conditions are met. You choose an up-to-date research tested recipe. You would do this with a boiling water canner as well. You prepare jars and food according to the tested recipe. So that's generally um, cleaning your jars and then warming your jars before filling. You ready the canner, um, which is um, either uh, preheating optional for a steam canner. So you might um, preheat some water in a boiling water canner and a steam canner, you may preheat. There's a little bit of water that's in the base of this canner. If you wanted to preheat it, um, you can certainly do that. Um, it's optional, but it, you can do it if you want to. So to ensure that you're processing at the correct temperature, which is basically boiling, wherever boiling is for your elevation, what you're going to do is you're going to vent for one full minute before timing the process. So you put your canner on the stove and you watch for a full column of steam. In my experience, this is about a good six inches. Um, and I've got some recipes to kind of talk you through how this is going to work. But we, um, we put the food in, we're going to put that dome lid on, um, we're going to turn the heat on high, and we're going to watch for um, the water to, uh, I'm sorry, the steam to vent out of our steam of our steam ports. And generally, like I said, it's best to have a steam, steam vent hole on either side of that dome lid. And they'll come with at least one. Um, and our recommendation is if it only has one, then um, drill another opposite. Um, and you vent for one full minute. And this is not just a little bloop bloop of steam, which we sometimes notice when we're venting a pressure canner. You'll see the same, you're looking for the same, a similar phenomenon. But for a steam canner, you'll see, once you see a good six inches, you're going to set a timer for one minute. You want to vent it for one minute. And that makes sure that we get all the air out and we're processing in pure steam. Once that happens, we can start the process time. You adjust your process time for elevation, just as you would for a boiling water canner. You are going to limit the process time to 45 minutes or less. And that's because you only have two quarts of water and you cannot open that lid to add more water um, and interrupt the, the canning process. And your canner will or can is able to boil dry. I'm telling you, we did it. <laughs> so that's how we came up with this recommendation is you don't want to process food for longer than 45 minutes. Um, and if you're if you've got your heat really high, it might boil um, dry in less than that. So limit process time to 45 minutes or less. Um, it's certainly OK within a within a steam canner to have different size jars. You might have pints, you might have half pints, you might have quart jars. Again, processing on the largest jar size. Uh, or the longest time given in your research tested recipe, but do not stack jars. And that's because if you try to stack jars and then take the dome lid off, you risk um, 
um, the jar is tumbling out. So we try different things. And so don't stack them. That's not an approved process. And then after processing, allow jars to air cool undisturbed. So I'm going to put a, 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 um, a disclaimer here, I guess. Our research results apply to only this type of um, steam canner. There are some companies that sell a steam canner that looks like a boiling water canner and you and they supply a rack in a boiling water canner and they just have you put less water in a boiling water canner and put your jars above that. We did not study that type of canner. We do not understand how steam distributes in that type of canner that doesn't have these vent holes at the base of the canner lid. So our results do not apply to only applies to this type of steam canner with a dome style lid. Um, and yes, allow jars to air cool undisturbed means out on the counter um, on generally on a cake rack or on a towel. All right, so I'm going to go through two uh, quick recipes just to kind of see how we're going to mod or take a boiling water canning recipe and make it uh, into a steam canning recipe and then I'll be happy to answer the questions that might have come in. Okay. Tomatoes. I love canning tomatoes. All right. And I love canning tomatoes in my steam canner. <laughs> so hot crack, cr hot packed crushed tomatoes. This is what something that I do every year. So you select fully ripe tomatoes. And I said, yum, there is nothing better than a fully ripe tomato, right? That's why we garden. Uh, rinse, trim and dip into boiling water to remove the skins. This is somewhat optional. You could leave the skins on. I prefer not to do that. Um, I want a product that's a little more consistent with what I might find in the grocery store. I remove the cores. I quarter or slice these tomatoes and put in a kettle to quickly heat to boiling while crushing and simmer five minutes once all the tomatoes are added. This is in my boiling water canner recipe. I'm not deviating from that. While the tomatoes simmer, I'm washing and rinsing my jars. I'm keeping my jars hot. Um, I'll come back to a hint here. I'm going to add um, acid to my clean hot jars prior to filling. I happen to use citric acid is what I prefer, but you can also use bottled lemon juice for canning tomato products. Um, again, I'm not deviating from my boiling water canner uh, recommendations. I fill my prepared jars with hot tomatoes. I leave a half inch headspace. I apply my two piece lids and place the filled jars on the rack in the canner above simmering water. Could be room temperature water too. I'm one, a person who likes to kind of get the process going a little here. So I tend to have my water simmering in my steam canner. So what's a little different is what's in red. Once the canner is full, I take that dome lid and I place it um, over the jars in the canner. Um, and I turn the heat on high. Um, as the water boils in the canner, eventually you're going to see steam vent through the vent ports. Um, if your jars are hot, you've got a hot pack product and you've pre-simmered those. This might take five minutes. It might not even quite take that long. So um, eventually you'll see this steady column of steam out the vent ports. You vent for one minute and then I start timing my process. Um, um, heat. You can turn down the heat at that point, especially if it's a longer process and you don't want to run out of water, but you need to make sure that the canner vents during the entire timed process. So if you've got a process like that's 25 or 30 minutes, you're going to want to keep an eye on things to make sure that your canner continues to vent, just as you would for a boiling water canner to make sure that the boiling water doesn't fall below the top of the jars in the canner. All right, I'm adjusting for elevation as I need. Uh, pint jars I'm processing, in my case, for 35 minutes um, because I'm just under 1,000 feet, 980 some feet here in Madison, Wisconsin. Once I'm finished, um, I'm going to take that dome lid off and set it aside. You have to do it carefully because there's a lot of steam that comes out. I lift it away from me when I do that. And then I removed processed jars and 
and allow them to air cool undisturbed. And then uh, as you would, and we know to do, we check for seals. Um, um, uh, seals on our jars. And the recipe that I am citing here is from the National Center for Home Food Preservation on how to can tomatoes and crush tomatoes. Again, one of my favorite. It's really a nice product and it's so similar to what my family might be expecting from the grocery store, but better. All right, another one, strawberry jam. I think if the steam canner was invented for anything, it was invented for strawberry or for jam in general. And I always say that my family uh, jam, a toast is a jam delivery system. And so I was so glad when probably about eight years ago, the recommendations came out that allowed us to uh, process jam in pint jars rather than half pint jars because we just uh, pint uh, half pint jars were not enough. Um, so here I just included the ingredients, four cups of crushed berries, four cups of sugar, two tablespoons of bottled lemon juice, and a box of powdered pe pectin or a third a cup of bulk pectin. And again, the recipe steps as noted um, in the recipe itself. Um, uh, once the canner is full, again, you place the dome lid on the canner, turn the heat to high, um, wait to see a full column of steam, vent the canner for one minute, and you begin to time the process. This is a really quick process, especially as you fill a canner with maybe say eight half pints, and maybe you've got another eight right ready to go. It's it's a you can you can do a lot of jars when you're using a canner like this. The recipe that I'm using, actually, that I referred to, and I'm sorry, I uh, hadn't quite noticed that, is from Making Jams, Jellies, and Fruit Preserves. If we go to the National Center for Home Food Preservation, they refer you to um, tested recipes on the, the recipe that's included with the box of pectin. Well, I don't buy boxes of pectin anymore. I buy my pectin in bulk. So I just use a third a cup of pectin when it says a recipe might call for one box. So because of that, I refer you, if you're like me and don't have a box of pectin with the recipes in it, I refer you to our bulletin, Making Jams, Jellies, and Fruit Preserves, um, which has all sorts of recipes, um, many of them, um, well, absolutely identical to what you'll find on those boxes of pectin. There also are recipes for making jams and jellies without added pectin, so extracting the pectin from the fruit itself. There's information in our bulletin for um, remaking um, what happens if it doesn't work and how to remake um, jam and jelly um, and try, try the process over again if you're stuck with syrup uh, the first go round. Um, so that uh, link here is fyi.extension.wisc, which is short for wisconsin.edu um, backslash safe food. This is one of the sites, uh, websites I have. And then the page is actually a recipes page where we have other bulletins like this, but I think this one might be particularly useful, again, if you're like me and don't buy pectin in a box, but buy it in bulk uh, and generally order it that way. So not much of a modification. It's really um, the starting the processing time after venting. Uh, for those recipes. So a couple quick canning tips and we'll get to your questions. Don't believe everything you read on the internet. If it seems too good to be true, it probably is. There are so many sites that are um, purporting to be places where there's good canning information, um, but it's not worth your health or the health of your family and friends to rely on information that isn't tested and that we know is safe. So please uh, seek out um, research tested up to date recipes for home food preservation. Stay up to date, enjoy the uh, bounty of the harvest. Um, try a new gadget and use a steam canner to safely preserve, again, only foods that are high in acid, sauces, fruits, pickles, and jellied fruit products. All right, so where can you find some information? The National Center for Home Food Preservation, and I shared this URL earlier. Um, our Net North Central uh, Food Safety Network, um, and I've got the, 
I think you just have to search. I don't think I put the URL. Oh, I'm sorry, I did up here. I added it up here. Um, it's a little bit longer, but if you search online for NCF, SEN for the North Central Food Safety Extension Network. Um, you'll find a lot of great information. We have um, a handout, just two quick pages. It's called Steam Can It Right? It's on the web page, um, NCF SEN webpage. And what I did yesterday was I, I created a, just an image here and you have to scroll down the web page a little bit. So keep going and you're gonna see it's about like right there. It says steam can it right. And those are the ways, the, the hit, the hints and tips for taking that boiling water canning recipe and uh, safely canning that product using your atmospheric steam canner. All right, here's my contact information. And I see I've, I have left us about 15 minutes and I'm gonna turn it over to Julie to answer some questions. Just a reminder that there's a survey and I know we always need that feedback from you. So if you'll please make sure you answer the, um, the survey. All right, I've, I'll let, turn it over to Julie. Oh, thanks Barb and can you all hear me okay? We can. Okay. Thank you. Good. I'm glad your day is improving. <laughs> yes. My my computer just melted right at the start. Um, we have about a dozen questions, Barb. So here's the first one. Does this research extend to the multi-use water bath slash steam canner? So if I'm, I'm going to anticipate that that's a Victorio model where um, that model has a, gl a glass lid um, and vent holes in the top. We initially looked at that, um, but because of the glass on the lid, um, we don't have any evidence to say that you can use it. We don't have any evidence to say that you can't. So for something that's not a dome style, so a multi-use steam canner, you would actually have to go to the manufacturer and you would need them to provide you the information I've been able to share with you today so that you could know how to use it safely. Um, I'm going to do a follow up because this one just came in. And the question is, did your research show that a single vent hole results in an unsafe product? So. That is a great question. So the vent hole, so like it's right here, right? So um, the back to basics model that has this dome lid comes with a vent hole in either side. The um, Victorio model only had one hole. So we don't know. Um, we do know that you, you have to get the air. Air is an insulator. That's why we use it on our down jackets. <laughs> but that's not good for heat transfer to our jars. So for more effective heat transfer to your jars, we recommend that you, if your steam dome canner lid has only one hole in one side, use a drill or a nail to put another hole on the other side. You will get better venting. Um, and we believe that that, that translates to um, more effective processing. Okay, here's your next question. Is it okay to use the steam canner on a smooth top stove? So that is a good question. And again, it's gonna, I'm gonna refer you back to sometimes your appliance dealer. You can kind of see they, they have these ridges, so um, you can try it. Generally with a, with a smooth top stove, the biggest problem is where you have your canner extended beyond the burner, and especially for longer heating times, your stove top may crack, <laughs> and that's an expensive repair. So size your canner to the burner, and it would be a great question for your um, stove manufacturer. Um, but for shorter heating times, there's a chance that this that they will work uh, effectively. While you're on that topic, uh, what diameter hole should you drill? Um, I'd say it's going to come with one. 
uh, and just ma about match it. Let's see, it's about two centimeters, three centimeters, four centimeters whole or something like that. Quarter an inch diameter. How about that? <laughs> All right, that works. Um, and another good question, because everyone is usually a little bit afraid of pressure canners. Um, what are the personal safety risks when using a steam canner? Can it blow up? Excess steam? Glass it, breakage? Yeah, that's great. It, it can't blow up because you'll notice if you use yours like I do for tomatoes, where it's a little bit longer process, sometimes that dome, there'll be a little pressure built up and sometimes the dome will tend to kind of elevate, wants to pop off. It won't do that. It sits pretty snugly in a ridge on the base. Um, probably the biggest risk is when you take the lid off, um, tilt the lid away from you without knocking the jars so that the steam initially goes away. Um, we do know for a boiling water canner, the more recent instructions say to leave the jars in the canner for 10 minutes um, prior at the end of the process time prior to moving them to the counter for cooling. Um, that's not a food safety reason. That's a jar breakage reason. And I will confess that I am way too busy to wait 10 minutes. So I just move my jars at the end of a process time, even in a boiling water canner, immediately to the shelf or to the countertop for cooling because generally there's more to go back in that canner. Um, so um, with a steam canner, there's no reason um, to leave them in the canner. You can if you want to, um, but there's no reason to do so. And you might have covered this already, but is there a particular brand that you recommend when purchasing a steam canner? So we, all I can say is um, we tested the back to basics model most extensively. Back to basics, I believe, is no longer being manufactured, unfortunately. Um, but we also tested uh, Victorio um, or VKP steam canner. Those are still available. They're both this dome style um, lid. So those are the ones that our research clearly applies to because they're the same type of appliance. Um, other types of steam canners, we just, we didn't have a chance to do work on those. All right, thank you. Uh, so you mentioned a, I think it was a chocolate dessert sauce. Yes. And somebody <laughs> wants the recipe and is it on the National Center website? Yes. So um, that, uh, I think we initially uh, picked that up from Ball, one of the Ball Blue Book recipes or Ball Complete Guide to Home Canning uh, recipes. Again, this type of recipe, the, the National Center is also a great place to look. It's really quite delicious. It's like an ice cream uh, dessert topping. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. After months of tomato <laughs> juice processing, the lab smelled really, really good when we got around to this chocolate dessert sauce. It's chocolate and raspberries together. It's really quite yummy. Okay, now we're all hungry. Yes. <laughs> uh, a couple questions, and I think you might have covered these. Do you keep the burner on throughout the process? Yes, you do. You must keep the burner on. So you can turn it, turn the heat down. Um, so as long as it's venting, um, it doesn't have to vent, you know, really, really forcefully. It does have to vent. Um, we're happy to answer questions. I think myself and any anyone who's used these, we're happy to help you if you're if you're trying to figure out if you buy one of these and and want to um, uh, have some questions about that. Just let us know, and we'll be happy to kind of work you through it. I can't imagine my um, home food preservation arsenal without a steam canner. I'm so glad that we found out that they worked because I'm not sure I would have been able to give mine up. All right, a uh, couple more about taking the jars out. When you say cool undisturbed, do you mean leave the dome lid on? Nope, take them out of the canner, just as you would a boiling water canner. So take the lid off, put it to the side and then move those, can those jars from the rack in the canner to some type of 
cool surface for cooling um, either a generally I put a either a, a cloth towel I sit them on my counter away from um, drafts and those kind of things or I'll put them on a cake cooling rack um, again and just happily listen to the jars um, popping shut so kind of a follow-up when processing is done, do I leave the dome on for five minutes before I move my jars or do I take the lid off for five minutes and then move? You don't have to leave. Once your timer um, gives you the signal that your process time is done, then turn the heat off so you're not continuing to create steam. Um, and at that point, you may take the lid off the canner and then take the jars out of the canner and move them to a rack or some other surface for cooling. And then there was a question about using liquid versus powder pectin. Oh, yeah. So we, we say use the whatever your recipe calls for. So, right. I don't know of bulk pectin that's liquid. Um, so I choose um, recipes that call for dry pectin, powdered pectin, because I buy powdered pectin in bulk. Either way, we say just use a tested recipe. You'll have not only a safe product, but it will also be delicious um, when you do that. And here's the next question. It appears that the time is less for a steam canner than a water bath canner. Is that true? So it, it's, it is true with a qualifier. The overall time with a steam canner is shorter because only because I'm not having to boil 16 quarts of water, which might take 20 or 30 minutes. However, when a recipe says for a boiling water canner says your process time, the time where you start your timer, once the jar, once the water is boiling, when that time says 35 minutes, it is exactly the same time in your steam canner. It's the same 35 minutes. It's just processing in steam, not in boiling water. And that's a really, really great question. And if there's follow-up questions that you have, please ask because we would like to be able to uh, make sure if, if you're at all unclear, just give me a call or send, send me an email and we'll be happy to follow up with that. Two questions left and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Is rhubarb considered an acid food? It is. It's got a different acid. It's oxalic acid. It's not a citric or malic or acetic, um, but yes, it is. And the last question, and thank you so much, Barb, for rolling with this when I was not on air. Um, would this process work on a portable burner cooktop instead of risking a cracked smooth top? It certainly could. I think some portable units are induction burners, and those require particular types of um, of 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 cookware, right, for for that um, current for those to heat. Um, so it, it's certainly worth checking, uh, or checking into um, would be really quick and easy to do if you had a separate uh, little burner um, that could do um, this kind of thing. So that brings us to the end of today's session. And I hope that all of you continue to join us. We have several sessions left, including another presentation about food preservation a little bit later. And thanks so much, Barb, for a great talk. And you got a lot of kudos popping in in the, um, in the chat. So thank you. And thanks to everyone for being here. Yeah, thank you. And just let us know if you have questions. We'll be happy to answer those um, as we're having to conclude today's program. Thanks so much, Julie, for helping us share this research that we were able to do. And I hope all of you enjoy steam canning um, as much as I do. Mm -hmm.